Hey, how you doing? Thanks for joining me. Uh, I'm going to do something a little bit different in this video. Uh, what I'm going to do is run through a PowerPoint that will hopefully help you uh, gain some understanding on troubleshooting applications in different types of circuits. Uh, I created this PowerPoint for classes of mine to just kind of run through to give them an introductory into what voltage should I expect in different places and uh, also we'll take a look at ohmic readings and how those kind of apply to troubleshooting as well. Um, so the first thing we're going to take a look at is we'll start out, we're going to put this over to a laser point here so we can use that. We're going to start out with our ohm meter and we have it connected across an open switch and in series with that open switch we just have a light bulb. Okay, so first thing we're going to do is we're going to turn our meter on. Okay. And what voltage do we think we should expect to see? So I'm going to talk about something in this video called, called the voltage divider concept, which if we think about a series circuit, um, the ohmic value of a component is going to be directly proportional to the amount of voltage that's dropped across that component. So if we have a really high ohmic value, we should expect to see a really high voltage drop. If I have a low ohmic value, I should see a low voltage drop. I like to use the voltage divider when I'm doing things like troubleshooting, especially when it comes to what voltage do I expect. So when we think about this open switch right now, and we think about the ohmic value that it could be, an open switch has a almost infinite amount of resistance or impedance across it. Okay? And if I'm reading in this circuit an almost infinite amount of resistance or impedance, I should expect to see the maximum source voltage available which across an open switch like this, I should see that. I expect to see 120 volts across this open switch. If I think about the potential, right now my line one is connected to my red lead, which means my red lead is at the potential of line one. My black lead is connected to the potential of identified. It's through a load, but we'll talk about the voltage on the load here in a second, okay? It's through a load, so I should see the potential across here of line one to identified, which would effectively be my 120 volts. So we're going to move our meter leads over to our actual load or our light bulb here. Okay? We know that we had 120 volts across the switch when it was in the open position. We're going to go back to the voltage divider principle. If we think about this as a series circuit, okay, if I had a maximum value of impedance here, well, I know that a light bulb that's not burnt out has some value of impedance. But when we compare that some value of impedance, maybe 8 ohms or something like that, to the infinite ohms of the switch, we can expect to see respectively almost zero volts and that's really what we do see here we should see zero volts across that component okay, another way to look at it is my black lead is at the same potential as identified while my red lead well if we trace it back it's connected to this terminal but that's not connected to anything right that's effectively like taking that red lead and just waving it in, waving it in the air i shouldn't see any voltage there there's no potential across the load right now okay so let's look at the next one we close our switch we see that our light bulb comes on, okay? Now what voltage should we expect across that light bulb? Well, if we think again about the value of impedance at this switch, I know that a closed switch has very, very low impedance. And if we think of the voltage divider principle, if I have very low impedance here, I would expect almost zero volts here. And that's what we expect across a closed switch. If it's connected into a circuit, we should see zero volts. If I move over to my load, again, this does have a value of impedance. And when we compare the value of impedance to the zero or almost zero ohms over here, I can expect respectively that all of the voltage in my circuit will be at my load now. Okay, so we close our we, 120 volts. Okay, so my red lead is at the same potential right now as line one. My black lead is at the same potential as identified. But what happens if we remove the load? Okay. My red lead is still at the same potential as line one, and my black lead is still at the same potential as identified or ID, which if we look at the meter reading, we still see 120 volts. This kind of gives us a window into the fact that maybe voltage isn't always the best application or doing a voltage reading on a load isn't the best way to indicate that the load is failed, right? because it tells us 120 volts whether the load was there or not. Let's move to the next situation. We have our switch closed. We have our light bulb energized. What could we expect to see across this reading right now, across this closed switch? Again, very low impedance across the switch means we should see very low voltage across that switch, 1.1. Or if I think about potential right now, my line one 
or my red lead is at the potential of line one, but my black lead is also at the potential of line one, which means there is no potential difference between these two, which gives us our zero volt reading on our meter. What about now? We got two switches connected in parallel controlling the same load. Okay, we won't talk about the functionality of this realistically. We would have to have both of these switches in the open position to turn the light off, and either one of these switches would override the other. Okay, but for what we're talking about, what voltage could we expect to see? This comes back to having an understanding of, if we'll call it equivalent resistance in parallel. If I have two loads connected in parallel, I know that the equivalent resistance of those two loads will be less than either of these two. Okay, they're not really loads, they're switches, but it still applies to switches as well. If I have two closed switches, that's essentially the same point. All of this is exactly the same point. So like previous, I would see zero potential across these because both of these leads are at the same potential as line one. And that's what we see is 1.1 millivolts, right? Another thing to watch for on these uh, auto ranging multimeters is make sure you're paying attention to the little prefixes that pop up in the screen because 250 millivolts is a lot different than 250 volts. 250 millivolts is effectively zero. I can get more voltage on a, a meter just by waving the leads in the air. Uh, but make sure that when you're expecting 250 volts, you're not reading 250 millivolts. Okay, so let's open this switch up. One of these switches connected into this parallel group right here is open. We're going to decide what do we expect to see with a light bulb and what do we expect to see with a voltage reading across our switch. Okay, so again, if we think about that parallel impedance equivalent, this switch right now is closed, which means it has effectively zero ohms of impedance. If it's connected in parallel to this open switch and I have my meter across that group, I'm going to read effectively less than whatever load is connected in parallel. That's one way to look at it. Okay, so we should see if I have 120 volts applied, right now line one is connected to uh, my red lead, but it's also through this closed switch connected to my black lead, so they're black lead. So there's, they're again the same potential. We should see zero volts across my switch configuration, which means I should see maximum voltage or 120 volts across my load. So if we were to put our leads across our load right now, we would see 120 volts. Okay, so let's look at our next configuration. So we've taken the switches out of parallel, now we've got them connected in series. We have one switch closed and one switch open. Okay, and we notice that our load is actually de-energized right now. So let's think about the uh, voltage divider, first of all. Okay, so I have zero volts across my switch right now, or sorry, zero ohms across my switch. Um, I should expect to see zero volts across here as well, but there's another way to look at this too. Line one, my red lead is at the potential of line one. My black lead is at the potential of line one as well. Okay, so we should expect to see zero volts across that closed switch. If we move our leads across the open switch, well that line one, that red lead has the same potential as line one and my black lead has the same potential as identified now. And again, we have that almost infinite resistance here or impedance, I should see the maximum value of voltage across this switch or 120 volts. Okay, if I move my leads over to my light bulb, okay, again, if I'm seeing 120 volts here or maximum impedance here, Okay, with respect to that almost infinite impedance here, I should see almost zero voltage here, which we do. Okay, and then if I take my leads and I have my black lead here, if we look at that, it's connected to the identified, so the black lead is at the same potential as identified, while the red lead way over here is connected to line one. So my red lead is at the same potential as line one, my black lead is at the same potential as identified. So effectively, I'm just reading straight across my source voltage. Okay, and that's exactly what we see is that 120 volts. Let's open up both switches. Okay, so again, if we look at where my red lead is, it's in direct contact with line one, so it's at the same potential as line one. And my black lead is at the same potential as identified. So I'm reading again source voltage. If we look now, this one's a little bit trickier. We have to think of this black lead is still at the same potential as identified, but if we look at where the red lead is, it's kind of connected to this portion of the circuit that's just kind of floating in the middle of the air, 
right? There is no potential here. When I say no potential, I'm not saying we have 120 to zero. I'm just saying it's like this lead isn't even in the circuit at all. Okay, so this would be effectively like holding one lead to identified and the other one just waving it around in the air. You're not going to read any voltage here. Okay, and that's exactly what we see on the meter screen. Okay. Let's switch it up. Okay, we're going to go away from the light bulb and we're going to look at just a simple control transformer and we're going to actually apply this to uh, both sides of our load. In a previous videos, I have um, gone through kind of the transformer action of how transformer works. Over here, I just have what's represented is, I just have the symbol for our inductor, right? We have in between H1 and H2, we have a coil. And in between X2 and X1, we have another coil, right? We have our primary or high voltage side, and we have our secondary or our low voltage side, and they share a common core. Okay, so when I energize this transformer, what it's going to do is the current will flow through the primary coil, creating a magnetic field, and that magnetic field in the core will induce a voltage on the secondary side of the transformer. And this is just meant to be a 120 step down to 24 volt control transformer. Okay, so we'll use it to kind of run through similar examples to what we did with the light bulb. So the first thing we're going to start off with here is uh, we have our open switch that controls our transformer. And just like our light bulb, Okay, we know that our light bulb had a certain amount of impedance. We know that it's more than zero, but we know that it's far, far less than infinite. If we think about our open switch, our open switch has almost infinite. So again, back to the voltage divider principle, I can say safely that my almost infinite value of impedance across my switch means I should have maximum voltage available or 120 volts. If I move my leads over to the primary coil on my transformer between H1 and H2, I know that my switch has almost infinite impedance. This coil has considerably lower impedance than that open switch. I should see zero volts across my transformer right now. There's no voltage applied to my transformer. Again, another way to look at it is my black lead is connected right to my identified. Okay, My red lead isn't really connected to anything. It's connected to H1 on the transformer, but because of that open switch, again, this is kind of like holding the red lead up in the air. I'm not gonna get any voltage across that. Okay, so we should see zero volts across our transformer. If we close, or sorry, we'll, if we check out the secondary side of our transformer, we go back to how that transformer actually works. If I don't have any current flow through the primary side of my transformer, I will not have a magnetic field inside the core. And if I don't have a magnetic field inside that core, I'm not going to get a secondary induced voltage. So I, should, so I should expect to see on the secondary of my transformer, no voltage, right? And I've just kind of shown the meter leads out here connected out to these outer rails to indicate if I had any type of, type of a load connected across these, um, I would see zero volts across those as well. Zero volts induced on the secondary of my transformer means that I've essentially, I've got no power supply for this circuit down here. Okay, so let's close that switch. Okay, and what voltage should we expect across a closed switch if I have my load connected? As previously with the light bulbs, I have almost zero impedance, which means I should have zero volts. Okay, and that's what we've got there. We move our leads over to the primary side of our transformer. Now, with respect to this being effectively zero, whatever impedance I have on the primary side is going to be far greater than zero, I should expect to see whatever the maximum voltage of the circuit is, right? So 120 volts I should read across that transformer. Another way to look at it again, H1, uh, my line, my red lead is at the same potential as line one, my black lead is at the same potential as identified, meaning that I have 120 volts applied to the primary side of this transformer. Okay, and again, transformer action. If I move my leads to the secondary side of my transformer, both of my coils are intact. I should expect to see the secondary voltage of my transformer now. Uh, that is my induced secondary voltage. And again, this is a 24 volt secondary side, so we should expect to see 24 volts. And again, if I move those leads out to these rails, um, what that's doing is just indicating if I had any leads connected to those rails, I could expect to see 24 volts applied. Okay, and there we go, there's our 24 volts. So let's look at what happens in this situation. Okay, I've got my switch is still closed over here. But if you look at what's happening here, I have a broken coil. Okay, another way to indicate that I have a broken coil or say that I have a broken coil is maybe that coil is burnt out. 
Okay, before we move on, I'm just going to kind of describe the differences between an open coil and a shorted coil. Because there's two, there's kind of three scenarios we could see. We have our normal functioning coil, which would have some value of impedance. That means it's a functioning load. I could have a burnt out coil, which means that, like if you think about a burnt out light bulb, there's no path for current anymore. It has effectively infinite impedance across this gap right here. If we think about a shorted out coil, that's like saying we're going to take a wire and go straight from H1 to H2. Okay? That would mean that I would effectively have zero ohms. That'd be like a closed switch across H1 to H2. So when we refer to a burnt out coil, we are effectively saying that that coil has near infinite resistance. Okay? So again, if we think about this, I have 120 volts applied. I have a closed switch over here which means zero ohms across this switch, which means I should have zero volts here. Okay, again, my red lead is at the same potential as line one. My black lead is at the same potential as identified. I still have 120 volts applied to my transformer. Okay, so just like that light bulb example previously, by burning out the coil, we still have that same measured voltage across this coil. So that's not gonna indicate to me that I have a bad coil, okay? I can move my leads down to the secondary of my transformer, and I know that again, if I have no path for current through that, that coil, I'm not gonna build up a magnetic field. There'll be no moving magnetic field in my core, which means I should not expect to see induced voltage on the secondary, and I should see zero volts on the secondary. Okay, so zero volts on the secondary would indicate to me that there's probably a problem with the transformer but we can isolate it even further, okay? But I will first, let's take a look at what happens if we have a burnt out secondary. So we know that a burnt out primary, we're still reading 120 volts H1 to H2, and we're reading zero volts X2 to X1, okay? So if we look now, we have our secondary coil is burnt out. So H1 and my red lead is still at the same potential as line one over here. My black lead and H2 are still at the same potential as identified. So my meter should still read H1 to H2, 120 volts. So if you notice, a broken primary and a functioning primary both read 120 volts. If we move it to the secondary, okay, again, I'm still, I, now I have a current path through my primary, so it is creating a magnetic field and we are seeing that magnetic field in the core. But because I have this broken secondary coil, I'm not going to see any induced voltage out the secondary side. Okay, so what I should see is effectively zero on the secondary side. So if we run through what just happened, with a broken primary, we read 120 volts on the primary, zero volts on the secondary. With a broken secondary, we read 120 volts on the primary and zero volts on the secondary. So both of those indicated to me the exact same voltages. Okay, that right there tells me that if I'm troubleshooting a load, maybe voltage isn't the best tool to use. Okay, there's another setting on our meter that could actually help us isolate which side of our transformer is, well, broken or open circuited. Okay, so we are going to click our meter over to an ohmic value reading. And before we get back to our transformer, we're just gonna run through what the differences on a meter are when we see OL pop up and effectively zero ohms, because the two get confused quite often. If I look at my leads right now, both of my leads are held apart from each other. If I think about the value of impedance in between these two, it's gonna be near, it, it's gonna be a lot, it's gonna be near, um, uh, it should be in the millions, right? Um, so this meter is designed to read probably up to about a million ohms. Um, so effectively anything over a million, this meter is gonna basically tell me that it's infinite ohms. Okay, so if I take my meter reading, what should we expect? If I have my, read or my uh, meter leads held apart, we should see our meter indicate OL or over limit, okay? not overload or anything like that, OL indicates over the limit range of the meter, okay? Which in this case, it could be in the millions, right? It's not infinite, because if I had enough voltage, I could bridge this gap. We know that, we can bridge air gaps with enough voltage. But the meter uses a little internal power supply, which is not anywhere near hard or big enough to bridge the gap, so it just tells us that it's over limit. If I take those two leads and I touch them together, I've effectively taken that 
value of impedance from almost infinite to almost zero. In between these two leads, there is almost no resistance or impedance. I should see my meter indicate almost zero. It's not going to be exactly zero because the copper or the conductor itself in the meter lead still has some value of impedance, uh, but it's very, very close to zero. Okay? So it's a good technique to use, for example, when you're troubleshooting or trying to figure out if a fuse is still good. Don't just look at the fuse because they can burn out inside the end caps where you actually don't see that. Take your meter, put a lead on one end and a lead on the other, set it to continuity, okay, and then check. If you have zero ohms, what that tells you is there's continuity between those two ends. Your fuse is still good if you're reading zero ohms. Okay, it's like saying we have a closed switch. If my meter indicates OL, that tells me that there is no path for current through that fuse and then that fuse would be indeed burnt out. Okay, so let's bring it back to the transformer. So right now, we have our burnt out primary coil. Okay? And you'll notice over here, I've got that switch open. In the previous slides, we had the switch closed to check the voltages. One of the things you need to remember, and it's imperative, if you are doing continuity checks on anything, make sure you are working with a de-energized circuit. These meters do not like to be connected to energized circuits. It's very bad for them. Okay, so when you are doing a continuity check or a resistance check on a component, make sure you de-energize the circuit. It's best if you can isolate the component because then you know you're reading truly across this coil. Right, so let's think about that. Right now, if I have a burnt out coil and I'm checking H1 to H2, what should I expect on my meter? I should see OL indicated because it's almost infinite value of impedance. Okay? If I was to move these meter leads to the secondary, well, my secondary coil is still good. I should read something. It should be more than zero, should be less than infinite, should be significantly less than infinite. And on this one, just as an example, I've put 48 ohms in there. Okay? That indicates to me that the primary side of my transformer has a burnt out coil while the secondary is still functional. Okay? If we change it so that we have a good primary coil and a burnt out secondary coil, now if I think about that ohmic reading on the secondary, it should be like the burnt out primary where I should see OL indicated on my meter. Okay? So again, just to kind of recap what we've talked about here, uh, the voltage readings that I got from a burnt out primary and a burnt out secondary were identical. That would not indicate to me which side of the transformer was faulted. Obviously, it would tell me that if I had 120 volts applied to my transformer and I had zero out, there's probably a problem with my transformer. Okay? And realistically, what you do with a control transformer is just chuck it in the garbage and, uh, and buy a new one. Okay? But when we're talking about components like this, for example, we can actually isolate which side of the transformer is burnt out by switching over to our ohmic value or our continuity check. Okay, again, when we had a burnt out coil on the primary, it indicated OL on the primary and something on the secondary. When we switched it and had a burnt out secondary, if I was to read H1 to H2 right now, I would expect to see some ohmic value greater than zero, but less than infinite. Okay? On my secondary, we're indicating OL, and that actually tells me that my secondary would be burnt out. Okay? So, Hopefully this video has helped you kind of expand your knowledge of troubleshooting. Obviously, I just used a couple specific examples. Um, but uh, again, make sure when you're reading components, if you're reading the actual loads, don't always trust the voltage. Because if I had, for example, say a burnt out gas valve in a furnace, the gas valve, if I was to meter across the gas valve and everything was working, I would still see 24 volts across the gas valve even though that little uh, relay coil or solenoid coil inside the gas valve could be burnt out. So, always a good idea to check with an ohmic value as well. Uh, if you can isolate a component, obviously do that, then you're not reading accidentally across the secondaries of the transformer instead of the gas valve. Uh, but anyways, again, hopefully this has helped you kind of deepen your understanding of troubleshooting. Thanks for joining me, and, uh, and we'll talk to you next time.